We have here with us today uh, Michael Harden from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, who's an independent scholar uh, who edited the last book, Reading uh, the Bible with René Girard. So, Michael, I would like to start asking you, when did you first hear about Professor René Girard? It was 1987, I can tell you exactly. It was October 15th, 1987. At that point in my life, I'd been reading one book a day for at least a dozen years. And I used to go to the bookstore in the afternoon to get my book for the rest of the day and into the night. And I saw this book on the shelf and it said, must there be scapegoats? And I thought it's an interesting title. So I pulled it off. I opened up the fly leaf and on the inside, it, so, uh, the marketing piece, it says Raymond Schwager's reversed three millennia of biblical interpretation. And I said to myself, well, I won't say in this interview what I said to myself, but I close the book. I look on the back cover from the genius of Girard, Schwager has wrought a revolutionary paradigm of biblical theology. And I just said no, and I put it back on the shelf. And I spent about an hour looking for another book, but that one kept calling me back. So I picked that one up. It took me three days to read it. My mind was blown. I went to a friend of mine, Professor Ed Halston, who's recently deceased, and he was professor of pastoral care and counseling. And I shared with Ed my excitement about Schwager's book. And so we agreed we would read Girard together. And so we both ordered everything by Renee at that point in English, of course. Uh, and there was just deceit, desire, the novel, violence in the sacred, things hidden had just been translated and published in, in 87 and the scapegoat. And we devoured it. And I wrote all my papers that last year of seminary on Girard. And uh, I went into the pastorate and just was reading just everything I could, Girard, everything. It was there. I bought every book. I read every article. It didn't matter. There wasn't that many at that time. You know, you could, you could read the whole Girardian corpus and, and all the secondary literature in about six months. It wasn't that difficult. Now I forget about it. It's wonderful. It's exploded. And um, I called Renee on the phone several times over the next couple of years uh, as I was starting to work through what would become my primary Girardian interest that ends up in articles throughout my books and then eventually my PhD dissertation, the relationship between revelation and religion. And so we, we were talking about that even at the very beginning. Uh, in 1990, in the autumn, I attended uh, with, with Dr. Halston the American Academy of Religion SBO meeting, and we both presented papers there, and Walter Wink was there doing a paper. And the following month, I think it was, in talking with Renee, he said, you must come to Stanford in May, and we're having a meeting. I said, okay. So I got to Stanford in May of 91, and that's where I met Renee and Martha and Father Schwager and all the great, great Girardians. Just amazing. Just an amazing group of people. Just stunning. That was the first time you met him. Yeah. And I've so that was the first time. And what was really, in 91, you know, what was really scary is that for the next several years, I would do presentation. I, I did a paper that I would end up publishing. Uh, on on my medic theory or my medic theory and obviously talking about Renee and Renee's always sat right there in the front row whenever I did a paper him and Bob Kelly I was sort of Bob's protege and him and Bob Kelly sit there and Renee I remember the one year I think it was 2004 at Ghost Ranch I've been doing wilderness survival training in Native American spirituality for 18 years. And in 2004, I was only about two years into it, but I saw so many congruences with my medic theory. And, and I'm doing this paper called Eco Spirituality, right? And Renee is sitting there with this grin from ear to ear. I mean, the whole, the whole time. And so is Bob. And I was scared. <laughs> I didn't know what that meant, but they really liked it. But yeah, in 1991, I met Renee. And uh, that would have been the second uh, official cover meeting. The first, the founding meeting would have been in 1990. So I'm, I'm not an official founding member of cover from the May meeting of 90, but I did come in 1990 and present at the AARSBL, so. Very good, yeah. Yeah. very good. Let me ask you, uh, in all these years that you spent with uh, Rene and Martha, uh, but I'm interested to know what kind of an impact did he have on you? 
to context that, I have to go back to that first meeting in 91. Uh, there was, I think, 30 or 35 people there. Bob Kelly, Bruce Chilton, Father Schwager, Diane Culbertson, Mark Ansbach, Paul Dumichel, um, uh Jean-Pierre Dupuis, I, I, I mean, um, uh, Judith, uh, oh, I, I can't remember Judith's last name, I'm so sorry. There was, there was that small group of Girardians that had come out of um, Bob Funk's Institute and then some others, right? But I was the only non-PhD there. I was just a pastor with a Master of Divinity. And they were really surprised that I would take time and come and be part of their scholarly meeting. I also happened to be a singer and a songwriter and I have some Girardian songs and I had brought my guitar and so I played my songs for them and, and uh, Bob, Troubadour, uh, Bob Hamilton Kelly dubbed me Renee's Troubadour and they, you know, they, you know, I mean, I'm, that was me. I'm just, I'm just an old hippie. And, um, <laughs> but they, they really, they, well, you can't see it, but there's the hair. <laughs> um, they, they really took a shining to me and I, to them, all of them, the whole group, it was, it was really brilliant. Um, and my, my memory of Renee, uh, and it's a constant memory because I, I knew Renee from, of course, the cover meetings, but also visiting him at his house. And then, Lori and I sponsored a conference in San Francisco and we, we had a nice, lovely uh, four days with Renee and Martha. And um, so I'm not one of those that was his student and saw him every day, but I saw him a lot and spoke with him a lot and talked with him on the phone. My impression of Renee, one is this, he's always jovial. He had uh, uh, that joie de vivre. He, he, their life for him was wonderful. And I think part of that was, of course, at the cover meetings, as we're growing over the years, uh, you see Renee's joy just grow uh, as this group becomes, in a sense, so large that he can't know everybody. And he sees his work done in so many disciplines. It was just the most fascinating um, organization for the first 20 years. Really was quite fascinating. Um, Renee also cared about people personally. I remember the first time my wife met him uh, at Ghost Ranch in 2004. And her and I sat down with Renee and Martha. And for about two hours, they just sat and talked with her. I mean, I sat there and listened. She was just going back and forth. And he, they just treated Lori just like this wonderful person that she was without, you know, and, and talk life. They just talk life, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, my, I, my, one of my best memories is sitting in a booth in Wiesbaden with Raymond and Sandy and Father Schwager uh, for about two hours in a long conversation, uh, drinking good beer. It was wonderful. With um, Renee. Yeah, with Renee and, yeah, and Sandy Goodhart and Father Schwager. Uh, Sandy's one of my favorites. I love Sandy um, like I do truly love few academics. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, Sandy and I struck up a good friendship right from the start and have had an interesting time together, a journey together. But I just have such deep love and respect for Sandy and, and so many of the others. Right. Yeah. But Renee, also, you know, when you, when you were working mimetic theory with Renee, um, for me, the experience was, it wasn't just what I was learning, but how I was learning from him. And so my experience with Rene was not question and my question, him answer, but my question, him questioning my question, my having to question some part of his question so that I could understand what kind of question I needed to ask in order to get an answer, you know? He right. did that. He in that and, and it was just incredible. And the other time, the only other time I encountered that was from uh, our Apache um, teacher, uh, grandfather, same, same style of teaching. Um, and you know, Renee's not Renee without Martha. And so my hope is that you will also uh, ask folks uh, about Martha, um, just as I am who I am because of my wife. I think Martha helped make Renee, shape Renee to be the person that he, he was and that he became. But you know, he was, uh, he was genial, um, he could be firm, but most of the time genial, you know. Um, he could be fierce on his critics. Oh, he was fierce on his critics. In private conversations, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, not unkind. He was never unkind. 
but yeah, he'd let you, certainly let you know where the flaws were. <laughs> so in case you went and read them. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any plans for the future to continue doing anything as your audience? Oh, the rest of my life will be devoted to uh, my medic theory. My first major project, Preaching Peace, uh, went through its own disaster in 2017. And uh, I had to literally uh, kind of walk away from doing anything uh, professionally that way. I had to actually uh, work, you know, uh, I eventually, I've, I'm now in uh, working with a, a company out of Germany that does uh, gold cryptocurrency. And so I've set up some nice wealth. As soon as I have uh, enough, I, I have a figure in my head, but as soon as I have that amount, I will restart my school of peace theology and it will be, um, you know, the best scholars in the world out there and I'll be able to give it away free to the human species because I'm funding it and nobody can take it from me at that point. Right. So yeah, I have a big plan for this. Good. I loved, I love Renee. I can't say, so you asked me how much does he change me? And I, I mean, that's one of the questions you sent me ahead of time. And I have to tell you, I can't even begin to say how much he's changed me. I am not me apart from my medic theory and Rene Girard. I'm just not even me. I'm not the, I don't have the spirituality that I have. I don't have the emotional capacity that I have. I don't have the confidence that I have. I, I am, I, I just look back and I think, what am I without Rene? And I go, well, I know where I was in 1987, you know, and then I know where I'm at today. And it's, it's living my medic theory. It's learning to forgive the enemy other, those that, that really can, you know, that hurt you and take away your life and your ministry and your livelihood and forgiving them that, you know, that was a challenge, but man, it was so important uh, to become, to literally become what both James Allison and I have been talking about, the forgiving victim. And he went through it with the Catholic church and I went through it with progressive Christianity. And when you experience that from the inside, you realize the power that Rene has brought to the table by juxtaposing gospel and myth. And you realize the power of this discipleship ethic that Jesus brings to the table as a model. You realize the extraordinary, unique, um, I'm going to use the word blessing, uh, that Christian orthodoxy brings in the way that Rene reads it. Um, and so one can look at the history of Christianity as a Girardian, and you can see all the flaws, but you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I think that's a real contribution Rene made that a lot of Protestant Girardians don't get. Uh, there's a tendency to want to throw Christendom out with and 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 christened this christ out you know with the bathwater and and i like Rene because so many times he says that mimetic theory is a proper interpretation of orthodox doctrine and i just think he's spot on about that right and so for example one of my ebooks is a mimetic theoretical interpretation of the nicene creed and i just walk line by line through it and do this this interpretation right <laughs> um so how has Rene changed me that's kind of like asking, how's Jesus changed me? I don't know. You know, I mean, it, or how's your wife changed you? It's all I can say is in every way. Right. And I'm, I am so grateful. I mean, I still talk to Renee. I'll sit out on my deck and I'll, I'll, I'll reminisce. And, I, and it's like having a conversation. And I, t I tell Renee all the time, thank you. You know, I, <laughs> I still do. Because we are surrounded by a cloud of living witnesses, you know, yeah. as Hebrew says. And I do. I do thank, thank the Father for Renee. I thank, I thank God for allowing me to be part of this whole um, experience. Um, my hope is that, you know, the movements that spring from my medic theory will, will deinstitutionalize themselves and get back to their roots. Uh, one that I founded, Theology and Peace, and and Cover as well, uh, which has lost its way, and. Um, yeah, there's, there's real hope. And, but here's the beautiful thing. Regular people, regular moms and dads, grandmas, grandpas, kids. I've had 18, 19, 20-year-olds call me to talk about my medic theory. 
I mean, hundreds and hundreds. I do a lot, a lot of phone calls with people. And there is a popular audience now, mimetic theories out there in some polarized forms, no doubt. But Renee's name is out there, mimetic theories out there. I think over the next five years, mimetic theory as uh, a heuristic tool for interpreting exactly what we're going through is going to become very, very important because I think the mechanism is gearing up for a major war right now, uh, you know, with currencies collapsing and everything and geopolitical issues. And I suspect there will be a move toward a scapegoat. And I just hope that the mechanism is so broken that the world doesn't create a scapegoat. I mean, the last Western scapegoat technically was Adolf Hitler or the last global scapegoat was Adolf Hitler. Right. And, uh, you know, we don't need that kind of figure again in human history. And we certainly don't need the kind of response that we had to do uh, now, especially because there's so, so many nuclear warheads and, and uh, uh, pathogens that have been created. And I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that COVID-19 is not a bioweapon, although it could be, but I'm just going to assume it's not. But we can see the devastation that one virus can do. That's right. You know? So, you know, my medic theory speaks to all of this. Uh, Rene did have that apocalyptic side at the end of his life there. And there were a number of Girardians that kind of, that, I mean, in conversations, they thought Rene went out to lunch with Eshevi Clausewitz. And I said, oh, no, this is perfect. And sure enough, here we are, 2020, and there's no better book right now than Clausewitz to read because we are in a battle. So, yeah, Renee's a prophet, too. But did Rene ultimately give a solution to this battle, in no. your opinion? Uh, well, Rene pointed to the gospel. Rene po and, and you can see this already in, in Things Hidden. He's pointing to Jesus as this model. There's a redefinition of the category of imitatio Christi that occurs in mimetic theory because in Christianity, one does not imitate the textual Jesus. One imitates and has a relationship with the living Christ. And this is particularly uh, uh, important for Roman Catholics who are doing this week by week in the Mass or daily through the daily office or the rosary or whatever the devotional process. It's very Christ-focused. Rene constantly pointed to this Jesus whose teaching was his life. This is the brilliance of Rene is that he really shows the congruence between Jesus' teaching and his behavior. And that's almost lost in historical Jesus scholarship. They claim to bring together Jesus' words and Jesus' deeds, but they really don't see them as a whole. And Rene did. Rene made a huge contribution to Jesus' studies if people would pay attention. That is Renee's solution, or is James Allison? I mean, <clears throat> when James Allison uh, wrote Raising Abel, uh, independently of one another, and James and I have talked about this a number of times, so I don't mind sharing it. We both discovered the category of the forgiving victim to get together, but but independently of each other. We weren't even communicating in these in these years. Right, and I had. Uh, written a paper in 1988 that laid out that framework that's now in all my books, you know, of the victim of myth, the victim in travail, and the forgiving victim. Already in 1988, the frame was there, and I just kept developing it. And so James, uh, oh, it was perhaps five years ago or so, four, five, six years ago, you know, pointed out that I've done for Protestants what he's done for Catholics right. <laughs> with my medic theory. Um, but the thing is, Protestants, um, all they have is a Christology. And you can't follow a Christology, especially the progressives. They're terrible. It's like, well, it's, you know, I don't know if that's a historical Jesus saying, I'm not going to believe it, but, 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 but they miss what's happening textually with Jesus, you know, through the memory of the church. And that's why, yeah, Protestants have been hard for me to deal with for 43 years. Right. I grew up Roman Catholic, you know, and, and somebody called me a roaming Catholic. And maybe I, I still am. Maybe I told you that story before. But right. yeah. So, yeah. I'm kind of curious with all this interaction you had with Rene. Uh, how come how come you didn't reconsider going back to your Roman Catholic roots? 
I, I would say there, there's a couple of reasons. The primary reason is that I cannot subscribe to the fundamental element of Catholic epistemology, which is the analogia entis, the analogy of being. Okay, I can't do that. I can use the uh, analogia fide, the analogy of faith, but I cannot do the analogy of being. That's the primary reason. In other words, what that means is I drank too deeply from the wells of the Swiss theologian Karl Barth. <laughs> you know, so um, that's the first. The second is that over the course of my adult life, um, I mean, as a young man, you know, we had John the 23rd, and then we had Paul the 6th, and uh, John, uh, John Paul uh, the 1st, he, he was quickly removed from office or died or whatever. Uh, John Paul the 2nd came in, and I, by that time, I was uh, in Bible college and uh, learning church history, and it just all of a sudden felt old-time Catholic to me. You know, and, and whereas uh, when I was 13, we left a pre-Vatican Vatican II congregation, and we ended up in a post-Vatican II congregation with guitars and the whole nine yards, and, and I loved it as a teenager, you know? This was like hippie heaven in church, right? right. And so, so when John Paul came in, and I thought, oh, this is just back to old-time Catholicism, I just kept my, I just kept on going. And then um, when Benedict was elected to the papacy, I had my doubts. I was nervous. But I read his book on Jesus, and I really liked it. I, I just, I really liked it. And then I started reading some of Benedict's scholarship, and then I really read as much as I could in the big controversy where he's quoting writers from the Middle Ages. And, uh, and I, I got to like, I, I like Benedict. I don't, I mean, I, I like Hans Kuhn, you know, and I'm sorry about the relationship they had, but but I did like Benedict, but he was still, he was having to hold the church between humanism and, and um, Islam. He was, I mean, that man, that they were, it was just pulling him apart. It was literally pulling him apart. And I think the election of Pope Francis has, is, is the one thing that, that just turned my heart right back to the Catholic faith. And in a sense that I could walk back into a Catholic church. I love Pope Francis. I will follow Pope Francis. And the problem is, if I go back to the Catholic Church, Francis isn't going to be here forever. <laughs> and we're going to get another Pope. Yep. You know? Yep. And so I don't, I don't want to come back and then have to leave again. It would break my heart. So I follow Pope Francis secretly. Right. <laughs> I wonder, however, what René would think about Pope Francis. René was not a Lefeverite, but René was conservative. Right. Um, I think he would like the way the Pope expresses his character with humbleness. Such humility just exudes from Pope Francis. And I think that was always important for René. Um, I don't, I can't think right now of any of major pronouncements you might be able to, uh, but I can't think of any major pronouncements that Pope Francis has made that René would disagree with up to this point. I just can't think of any. Right. Um, but I but again I'm not a Catholic. I don't sure keep them all in my head. Right. It would be difficult to figure it out. Absolutely. Michael, can you tell us a little bit about uh, uh, Rene Girard's last book, Battling to the End, which seems to be a very apocalyptic book. And he's uh, he's he's foreshadowing that the the world is gonna destroy itself apparently. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, that's, a, that's again a theme that runs through his writings. Uh, Wolfgang Pauliver, who is perhaps Rene's best interpreter in the world, certainly has made it a theme of his research, this Hobbesian war of all against all. Um, there's, let me tell you two stories. Uh, one is personal about Rene, and the other relates then to the writing of Battling. In 2002, I was at Purdue for the cover meeting, and my partner, friend, Jeff, Father Jeff Krantz, and I went to lunch with Rene, Sandy, Eric Gons, and Martha. And we sat around a table at an Indian restaurant, and this would have been um, June of 2002. And Rene said at that point at the table that he thought, you know, 
it was good real politic. Bush needed to go in and, and devastate the Taliban. And I turned to him, he was sitting right next to me, I turned to him. I said, but Renee, in Things Hidden, you talked about the importance of nonviolence. He says, well, this is different. And it was at that moment that was the turning point. My friend Jeff and I went back to the room and we said, we're gonna start preaching peace, which was my ministry, because I have to go where Gerard is afraid to go. I have to talk about nonviolence. I have to do this. And we started preaching peace. Well, over the years, Rene came to realize that the work I was doing in the Christian peace tradition was absolutely essential. You have this shift in Rene's thinking where he's going to write a book that he doesn't want to write. This is, this, is, this is not the book he wants to write. He sees Pope Benedict uh, struggling to maintain Western civilization between humanism and Islam. Uh, I think, I, I don't know how true this would be, but I think in R Rene's, in, in Asheve, you can see the Pope, as it were, stretched on a cross, or the, at least the Catholic tradition stretched on a cross, being pulled between these two. I think that Rene recognizes that the solution has always been in the gospel. I think in things hidden and uh, certainly up through 9-11, uh, 2001, he had a lot of hope for the solution of nonviolence and forgiveness. I think he went into real politic after that. And I did my best from 2000 and, you know, uh, two on to convince Rene that there was an alternative way to do this. And I mean, he felt good enough to endorse all my books and website and everything else, you know, and uh, say what he said. And he did tell me that I had really made sense what this business, this business about forgiveness. The problem with uh, Acheve Clausewitz is there's not a solution. You know, I mean, you can, you can pick up the book, you can go to the very last page, and you, and you have God has revealed himself in his son, that religion was confirmed once for all, thereby changing the course of human history. And he says, we have to wake up our sleeping consciences. Seeking to comfort is always to contribute to the worst. There's not a solution there. There's just a, we've got to wake up. Well, you know, that's, that's as far as Rene could get because Rene wasn't an evangelist. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he, he literally took it as far as he could get. And the thing about Acheve, and Tony Bartlett has been a fierce critic of this book, uh, uh, Battling to the End, because he feels Rene kind of betrayed the direction mimetic theory was going. Uh, and Tony has some valid points, but the importance of Battling to the End is that it doesn't, does not show a depressed old man. That's not the state of mind Rene is in. He, again, he's a realist. He's been reading St. Paul. He's working on a book on St. Paul. St. Paul is dealing with the principalities and the powers. This is a big theme. If you look at the interviews and things from that period of time, he's talking a lot about principalities and powers. He's doing research on it. So I think there's Very a natural... in the, I saw Satan fall like lightning in that book also. He wrote in that book, definitely in that book. That's correct. But I suspect Rene recognized that the world had two choices and it had take it had made the wrong choice and the choice is is repentance or apocalypse you know and unfortunately the human species doesn't repent until after apocalypse after world war 1 after world war 2 and I, I mean we we just don't learn our lessons man you know, and I think, I basically think we're, we're setting ourselves up for a major war here in the next three or four years that will truly make what Rene has done in Clausewitz and in, in Battling to the End, kindergarten material. So hopefully we won't get there. No, hopefully we won't. Hopefully we won't get there. <laughs> but it's inevitable. Currency systems are collapsing. Whenever they collapse, there's always a war. Well, thank you very much, Michael, for your time and for the interview. It was a very substantial interview. Thank you for making the time for this interview. And I hope to see you in person and to continue this dialogue. So oh, thank this you very will be much. wonderful. Thank you.